Uh, last night, how many of you were here last night for Fall Festival? Heard Justin talking about it. How many of you rode a shuttle? All right. Is there anybody in here that was on the last shuttle out last night with me? All right. Some of y'all were there. All right. Some in the earlier service. So uh, when you get on the shuttle with me, we're going to do something crazy. All right. So I just stood up and said, hey, this is the last shuttle out. We're full. Uh, we're going to sing something. And I said, who wants to lead us? Because if someone doesn't volunteer to lead us, uh, I'm going to lead us in a song. And I'll be honest with you, the only song I knew was 99 bottles of beer on the wall. <laughs> All right? And it's the one we sing on our men's ski trip every year and stuff like that. And so I said, hey, who wants to lead us? And sing? Stand up. She, she said, I'll do it. All right? And she started leading the entire bus. And, uh, and I'll fly away. Y'all give her a hand. Would you... You were, you were there. She tore it up, didn't she? Yeah, so you give her a, she's going to be leading worship here someday. So great job. Thanks for stepping up and saving the bus from me. Uh, but it was a great time. Today, we come to the end. If you are new here or new visiting with us online, um, we have been in the middle of a series entitled Blessed, Learning to Live with Eight Attitudes with Promise. We come to the eighth attitude today. If you missed any of the earlier ones, I want to encourage you to go to cottonwoodcreek.org, go to our online uh, uh, ministries, and you can see uh, those previous messages. And I'll tell you, as a pastor, I've been so encouraged uh, going, uh, going through this series on the number of times that people have dropped me a note or sent me an email or caught me even last night. I was called, called twice uh, by two guys talking about a, a message that was uh, uh, taught in this series and how it's really changed their life and changed their perspective. And so if you haven't heard all of these, I want to encourage you to go listen to them online. But today we come to the last one. Really, uh, it's the last beatitude found in Matthew chapter 5. And uh, it's interesting, when we come to this attitude, uh, this beatitude, Every one of these attitudes has an attitude, the Beatitudes has an attitude and then a promise. If we'll live with this attitude, Jesus promises us that God will honor us in this way or bless us in this way. And all of the Beatitudes, they're literally just one verse. Jesus gives us an attitude and a promise, and an attitude and a promise, and an attitude and a promise until we come to this last Beatitude. It begins in verse 10, but then after verse 10, Jesus gives two more verses of explanation on this beatitude. And it's really the idea that Jesus wants to make sure that we understand if we come into contact or if we come into a season of Christian persecution, when we are persecuted because of our faith, Jesus wants us to understand that we are blessed. And so this last message, I want to I talk to you on this idea. Attitude number eight that God blesses is when we learn as believers, as followers of Christ, to live with an unwavering resilience, learning to live with an unwavering resilience in our faith, that we are willing to stand strong for our faith, even when we are persecuted, even when we are oppressed, even when we are, uh, we're, we're attacked for our walk with Christ. That word resilience, I'll put the definition on here, it simply means the power or ability to return to the original form or position after being bent, compressed, or stretched. In other words, if we are going to live with this attitude, a resilient, unwavering attitude in our faith, in those seasons when we are pressed or compressed or bent or stretched, because of our faith, God blesses an attitude when we spring back, when we stand firm and we stand strong for our faith. Notice what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. This is the first verse. This is where we need to learn to live with an unwavering faith, an unwavering walk and resilience with Christ. Jesus said, blessed are those, here's the attitude, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. I'm going to come back to this here in a second. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me just stop you right there. If you've been here through the whole series, if you go all the way back up to verse 3, Jesus began with the statement, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs, same phrase, is the kingdom of heaven. 
Then he comes to the last beatitude in verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for his name's sake or because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you put those bookends together on the beatitudes, what Jesus is saying is this. See, the first beatitude said you and I cannot come to faith. We cannot come to salvation apart from being poor in spirit. We said being humble in spirit. What does it mean to be humble in spirit? I honestly acknowledge that I am a sinner, that I fall short of God's grace. I can't live my life like a Pharisee that think, you know, I'm better than this person, or I'm better than this group, or I'm better than these. And someday I'm going to show up to the gates of heaven, and God is going to look at John Mark and say, John Mark, you're better than most other people. Come on into heaven. That is spiritual pride. But Jesus said, our first beatitude, our first attitude with the promise, Jesus said, blessed are those who are humble in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. That means that I have to acknowledge in my own life that I am not good enough to gain God's love or gain God's favor. I have to go to the cross and trust that Jesus died for my sins and he was buried in my tomb. He rose again on that third day that if I trust in him and believe in him and have faith in him, then I receive the kingdom of heaven. Now we come to the last beatitude the one in many of the New Testament lie, uh, New Testament circumstances we're going to talk about here in a second, they were coming to their end of their life. They were going to be martyrs for their faith. They were going to be persecuted for their faith. And Jesus comes back with this same phrase. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. See, the first beatitude said the only way you and I receive eternal life, the ultimate promise of the kingdom of heaven, is by being spiritually humble. Now Jesus says, if you come to the end of your days on this life, and you are going to be martyred, you are going to be persecuted, Executed to the point of death for your faith, then you receive that promise you received at salvation. What did Jesus say in John chapter 14? He said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. What was Jesus saying? There are a lot of things that trouble us here on this world, in this earth. There are a lot of things that, um, that as blessed as we are in our country, there are many other believers around the world. Let me just tell you, when we come to this verse, We may have a few persecutions. We may have a few insults. We may uh, encounter a, a few people that are hostile to the faith. But if you look around the world, there are literally 215 million Christians who live around the world, who live in countries or provinces or spaces or places where they encounter either high, very high, or extreme persecution. I did some reading the last couple of weeks about the persecuted church and persecuted believers around the world. There are two uh, major Christian organizations that track Christian persecution around the world. One is called the Voice of the Martyrs, and one is called Open Door, the Open Door Ministry. And they track Christian persecution. This year, they, uh, their most recent estimate of all the millions of believers around the world, 200 And 15 million Christians right now today live in areas where literally they could lose their life for their faith. They gave the top 10 or they really gave the top 50 countries where people could lose their lives. There are a few interesting things that stood out in that list. For the 16th straight year, North Korea was number one. If you are a believer in North Korea, that you are prone, if it is found out that you are a Christ follower, follower, that you will be taken from your family and you will be placed in a labor camp the rest of your life. You say, why is that after 16 years? Well, guess what? In North Korea, guess who you are supposed to worship? Their leader, the family, right? And if you are found to be worshiping somewhere else, you know that at any moment, if you or your family is found out, you will be taken from your family and push, uh, uh, placed and pushed into forced labor the rest of your days with very little water and very little food. Number two on that list, which was very close to North Korea, was Afghanistan. And then you go to uh, number five on that list that stood out, Pakistan. Pakistan was number five on the list but it is the most violent place. If you are a believer 
in Jesus Christ on any given Sunday morning, like a daylight today, you could be attacked. There are more church attacks, more Christian attacks, more home invasions on Christians than any other place on the face of the earth. If you go all the way down, and we've heard so, many, so much over the last decade or so of um, radical Islam being, uh, uh, being uh, abrasive and attacking Christians, but there is a new There is a new challenge to the Christian faith around the world. It's called radical Hinduism. Go read about it. If you are in India, India comes in 11th because of radical Hinduism. If you are a believer in Christ, you are in, and you are in a certain province or a certain place or a certain space in India, you may well find that your worship service is interrupted someday and you are killed for your faith right there. You say, Pastor, what percentage of believers on the face of the earth today encounter high, very high, or extreme persecution. I said 215 million. That's one out of every 12 believers, one out of every 12 Christ followers on the face of this earth when they open up God's Word to read the Bible, when they come together for corporate worship, when they sing praises to God like you and I have the freedoms to do here in our country today, they never know if that might not be their last time to see their family, their last time to read God's Word, their last time to enjoy freedom on this earth. So I have a twofold purpose for today's message. One is to remind us that not everybody has it as good as we do. They just don't. But also then through God's word to challenge us if and when we do, we do encounter Christian persecution, we would then know how to handle it. Well, let me define for you what persecution means today and really in the New Testament days. Go ahead and put the definition of persecution up there. Here's what it says. You go to Webster's, you go to your online dictionary. It means putting to flight, driving away, or even following with hostile intent. In other words, if we are persecuted, that means you and I are being put away, pushed to the side, we're being marginalized, we're being laughed out, or in some places we are being followed even if we are walking away with the purpose of hostile intent. If you go all the way back to the New Testament, dokoi, which is the uh, New Testament Greek word, put it up there. This is the New Testament word that we find when we're talking about persecution that Jesus uses here in Matthew chapter 5, and Peter uses it a number of times in 1 Peter, and Paul talks about it, and John, uh, John talks about it, and James, the brother of Jesus, talks about it and uses this word. In the New Testament, it describes inflicting suffering on people who hold Christian beliefs. They are Christ followers that are unpopular in their province or their space or their place. Now, I realize that uh, there are some who are in here that um, we, we sometimes have a tendency uh, to think, well, you know, uh, uh, if I'm just nice to people, or if I'm funny about my faith, I won't be persecuted. I want you to know, don't ever forget that Jesus was funny. Jesus was kind and nice. Jesus was perfect, and they still persecuted him. They still took him and nailed him to a cross. And I submit to you that if he was to walk the face of the earth today, whether he was in Korea, whether he was in Afghanistan, whether he was in Pakistan, whether he was in uh, some place in uh, India, he would still be nailed to the cross today. And so it's hard for us to take ourselves out of the place and the space and the political environment we are in and try to understand where they are, those Christians who are persecuted on a day-by-day basis. Can I remind you of this word when it was first used in Acts chapter 7 in the New Testament church? In Acts chapter 1, Jesus said, hey, I'm going to go to the Father. And so he he ascends into the heavens. In Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches at Pentecost. Thousands of believers are saved. The church begins to grow. In Acts chapter 6, the church has grown so much that the disciples, the apostles, they can't minister to all the needs of the family. And so what they do in Acts chapter 6, they select seven men, and they basically ordain seven deacons to become deacons. In Acts chapter 7, one chapter later, we find Stephen, one of those deacons, who is now being stoned. Look at at it as we put it up on the screen in Acts chapter 7. 
You see this, here's what it says. It says this, at this, they covered their ears. Now, what does it mean they covered their ears? They're talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The same people that nailed Jesus to a cross have now called Stephen in, and they have told him to reject his faith and reject his walk with Christ. And you know how he responded? He responded by preaching the gospel to them. And it says, he covered his ears. At this, they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. And they rushed at him, and they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. It says, meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them, reflecting the compassion and forgiving heart that Christ had even on the cross. He said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Now pick up the reading in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. It says, and Saul, who would later become Paul, by the way, uh, in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus, it says, and Saul approved of their killing of him. It says, on that day, here's the word, a great persecution broke out, broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all, listen to this, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Look at this. It says, but Paul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged them off, both men and women, and put them into prison. Now, you just continue to follow on. Uh, every year, there were more and more Christians right after that early church, even after the New Testament canon was closed, that you would see persecuted believers losing their lives. If you go a hundred years later, the first recorded account of a martyrdom outside of Scripture, just as found in 155 AD, there was a bishop in Smyrna called Polycarp. You can look him up. You can read about him. A journalist in the day wrote down basically how his persecution and ultimate death took place. They called this 86-year-old bishop of Smyrna and who had planted churches. He had preached the gospel. They called him into the Colosseum in front of the proconsul there, and they said, you need to reject your faith in front of all of these people. And along with rejecting your faith, you need to swear your oath and ultimate allegiance to Caesar and Caesar alone. Polycarp responded to them. He says, if I repent from my righteousness toward evil, there is no benefit. Now notice, he used the word repent. That word repent, we think of oftentimes repenting of sin and going towards righteousness, repenting of sin and going toward faith. All he did was took the, took the word, which simply means to change your direction or change your mind. And Polycarp looked at the proconsul and he said, how is it going to benefit me if I repent from righteousness and move towards evil by rejecting Christ and swearing an oath and allegiance to Caesar? And the proconsul screamed at him, we will release the wild beast. You want to know how he responded? He said, release the beast. Then they said, that's not good enough. And the proconsul said, I'll give you one more time to renounce your faith and reject your faith. And Polycarp responded, he says, if you will give me time, I will share the gospel with you. He says, I'll come along you and tell you about righteousness. You know what they did that day? They burned him at the stake. They burned him at the stake. And throughout history, People have been persecuted to the point of blood and ashes for their faith in Jesus Christ. So I want you to write this down on your notes. Persecution is as real today as it was in Jesus' day. It may not be that way right here. It may not be something we feel right now, but we all need a sense and a heart and an attitude that if we are persecuted, for righteousness, ours is the kingdom of heaven. Let me just give you another thought. I want you to know, and I wanted to clarify this, because part of what I wanted to do today was two things. Number one, I wanted to remind us that we always need to be in prayer and thoughtful prayer and thoughtful identity with Christians around the world who are persecuted at extreme rates and levels, who lose their families and lose their daughters and lose their wives because of their faith in Jesus Christ. But I also wanted to challenge us to know how to respond if and when we are persecuted ourselves. But I want to remind you that not all 
persecution is the same. Not all persecution is the same. I want us to understand this. Notice Jesus put some clear modifiers. And here was his modifiers. As Remember I said verse 10 was the beatitude. Then he actually expounded on it in verse 11 and verse 12. Let's put Matthew chapter 5 verse 11 up here. He says, blessed are you when people insult you. I'm going to come back to these. Persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Now notice this modifier. Because of me, because of me. Now, as we think about that, if we go back to the original beatitude of verse 10, he says, blessed are you when you are persecuted because of righteousness. So when we talk today about living with an unwavering resilience in our faith, we are talking about Christian persecution. What is Christian persecution? It is when I am persecuted for living a righteous life, when I'm persecuted for living a life that honors Jesus' name. So I want to back up for a second and and basically identify, um, oftentimes we can equate some trial or hurt or difficulty that's going on in our life as Christian persecution. And I want you to know, not everything you go through is Christian persecution. Um, sometimes, let's be honest, we, we are persecuted or we go through a trial because we make a bad decision. I commit a sin. Uh, I say something wrong. Uh, I'm a meddler. I'm a gossip. Uh, uh, sometimes we can be persecuted at the office simply because we're a jerk. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? If that's the way you live your life, that is not Christian persecution. Christian persecution is when you and I are persecuted, we are pressed on, we are stretched, we are bent because of our faith. Notice, look at what Peter said. He says, for it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good rather than doing evil. In other words, Christian persecution is when we suffer for righteousness sake and we suffer for Jesus's name. Notice what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 14. It's a warning to you. He says, listen guys, listen gals. He says, if we suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even a meddler. What is he saying? If we suffer because we steal something, Because we rob our office, or we cheat the boss, or we make a mistake, or we're a meddler, or we're this, or we're that, that's not Christian persecution. So Jesus, even in this last beatitude, challenges us, we have to live righteous lives. We have to live God-honoring lives. We have to live in God-honoring marriages and God-honoring relationships and God-honoring work work ethics, with God-honoring words and God-honoring challenges to people around us. That's when Christian persecution truly is Christian persecution. So then you say, Pastor, if I am persecuted and I identify it as I am being persecuted for my faith because I'm a follower of Christ... Let me talk to you today about how to handle legitimate Christian persecution biblically. And so here, two thoughts. One, we always must remember others around the world will probably always have it far, far, far worse than you and I do. And we can't ever remember that. I mean, what do we think about? We we think about in our lives, who's on the Supreme Court, right? Right? Who's, who are, who's our senator? Who's our congressman? We think, man, we need some righteous people, but the reality of it is, even the marginalizing that, we might, that might happen to us as believers, that's nothing compared to the persecution that is going on day by day around this world. So let's look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, he said, blessed are you, here is, the, here is the explanation, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Now, let me remind you right here. You and I may be insulted. We may be mocked. We may be marginalized. We may be laughed at because of our faith. Now, listen, none of those will kill us. 
How many of you understand that? None of us will kill us. If we shrink back from that, we're going to shrink back from anything. We have to be bold in our walk and bold in our faith and bold in our righteousness. Then notice what Jesus said. He says, how do you handle it? He says, rejoice and be glad. Everybody say rejoice and be glad. Man, my prayer is, and one of the ways we talk and we teach and we talk a lot about defending your faith in here, as we journey forward as a country, I want you to know the drift as a country is not going to be towards faith. It's not going to be towards biblical truth. It's not going to be towards the cross. It's not going to be towards Christ. It's going to be away from it. And that's why not only do we need to be ready to be bold in our faith, we need to be training our kids to be bold in our faith. We need to train our kids, man, where do we need to go and how do we rely and how do we respond if we are mocked for our faith? Well, Jesus says, start by rejoicing and be glad. Why? Because he says, great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets before you, they will persecute you. What is he saying? He's saying, man, if there ever comes a season in my life where I am persecuted as a pastor, as a believer, as a Christian father, as a Christian businessman, I need to rejoice and be glad. Because it's then that I am really identified with my Savior, Jesus Christ, and with the prophets and priests who went before me. So thought number one, how do you handle? It's exactly what Jesus said there. How do you handle? First of all, don't throw a pity party. Write that down. Don't throw a pity party. Man, if you are being persecuted for your faith, don't walk around like Eeyore, all right? Put a smile on your face and say, you know what? I think, and there might be some, and I've heard, there might be some who you have never been persecuted for your faith. But on account of this series and this passage and and this message, that you're going to say, you know what? I've been silent too long. I've been quiet too long. I've been accommodative to the world for too long. I'm going to stand for my faith. And if I get persecuted... I am going to rejoice and be glad. Don't throw a pity party. Invite your friends over and bake a cake, all right? Or buy a cake in my position. I'd buy a cake, all right? But notice what James, the brother of Jesus, said. Look at it. This James, the brother of Jesus, he said, consider it pure joy. Everybody say pure joy. Isn't that what we usually do when trials come our way, when hardships come our way, when difficulties come our way? Don't we just get all excited about that? No, what do we do? Probably hang our heads. We pucker our lip out. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials or persecution or hardships of many kinds, because you know the testing, that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. What does that mean? A resiliency. Man, I get pressed on, I get bent, I get stretched. I'm going to bounce back into shape. Because God still has work for me to do. Here's a second way that I want to encourage you that biblically we ought to handle our persecution, Christian persecution when it comes our way. Don't be surprised by it or ashamed of it. Don't be surprised by it or even ashamed of it. Man, as you look at God's word and as we walk through it, I want you to understand it ought to surprise us more. As children of God, as followers of Christ, If I can look back over the last six months or the last year or the last decade of my life and I have never been at least mocked for my faith or laughed at for my faith, you know what that probably means? If you are not being insulted and mocked and laughed at, you're probably not standing for your faith very much. But notice what Peter said. Don't be surprised. Don't be amazed. He said, dear friends, He says, don't be surprised. Everybody say, don't be surprised. Man, don't be surprised. If all of a sudden you get a debate in the office and they start talking about the definition of marriage and defining marriage and all of a sudden you quote the creation account from Genesis chapter 1 and then they say, well, what about Jesus? He was so loving. And you say, well, look at Matthew chapter 18. Jesus said, from the beginning of creation, God created them male and female. Let me tell you what, chances are, unless you work at a church somewhere, the office isn't going to high five you. They're going to marginalize you, right? They're going to persecute you. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Now, listen, don't be a horse's rear either, right? You can say those same things and be gracious and loving and stand firm in your faith. 
But don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that will come against you to test you. Now notice, he used that word fiery ordeal. Because Peter knew of a crucifixion that day, but he also knew what was coming. It was not uncommon even in those days to burn people. To burn them alive. He says, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to test you. As though something strange were happening to you. Let me tell you what. What should be strange in the believer's life? Is that we're never persecuted. That we're never mocked. That we're never laughed at. That we're never made fun of. That you never just kind of have to step back and say, you know what? I think I was just persecuted for righteousness. I think I was just persecuted for Jesus' name. Look at this next passage, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16. He says, up here, he says, don't be surprised down here. Notice what he says, don't be ashamed. He says, however, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. Everybody say, do not be ashamed. He says, don't be ashamed of it, but praise God that you bear that name. Man, if there ever comes a time at the office where you're passed over for a promotion for your Christian faith, not for your lack of effort, For your Christian faith, uh, not for your lack of, uh, uh, because you're even the, the best qualified for the job, but you're passed over because of your faith, then you, then you say, thank you, God, because I bear your son's name. See, that's important, folks. Here's the third way we ought to handle our Christian persecution. Don't be afraid of it and don't run from it. Don't be afraid of it and don't run from it. Man, we've got to stand our ground. We've got to stand with Christ. We've got to stand with God's Word. We've got to stand with our faith. We've got to stand with our other Christian brothers and sisters in Christ. Man, don't be afraid of it and don't run from it. Look at what Peter said in two verses, one in chapter 3 and one in chapter 5. Put it up. He says, but even if you should suffer for what is right, notice there's the word, there's the modifier. We suffer for what? Christian persecution is when I suffer for righteousness or I suffer for the name of Jesus or I suffer for doing what is right. He says, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are, what's that word? Have I lost y'all already? I'm going to start persecuting y'all. You're blessed. He says, do not fear their threats. Don't be afraid and don't be frightened. Man, if all of a sudden Christian persecution begins to come your way, don't be afraid. Also, what did I say? Don't run from it. Look at it. 1 Peter 5, verse 9. He says, resist him, talking about the devil. Stand firm in your faith. Everybody say, stand firm. Man, if it comes this way, don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. Expect that that was going to happen. And then you stand firm lovingly and gently and respectfully, but you don't shrink back. Here's the fourth way you and I need to handle Christian persecution if it comes this way. We've got to learn to trust God with it and overcome it with good. We have to trust God with it and overcome it with good. Now, now what does it mean to trust God with it? We have to remember that Christ, who is the one we follow, who is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He led the way in this. He was winsome. He was kind. He was gracious to people. Think back of all of Christ's life. What did Jesus do? He went around feeding people. He went around making the blind see and the lame walk. He he went around forgiving sins of the adulterous woman, the woman at the well that had a lifestyle filled with sin and unrighteousness, who had been rejected even by her own Samaritan village. He made her an evangelist. She went back and it said the whole town followed her. Boy, if you think about that, John chapter 4, she was at the well by herself because she had been rejected by our town. Christ, because of his grace, sent her back, and the whole town follows her out and becomes saved. Man, he basically made her the preacher or the leader, the evangelist of that town. Man, Jesus did those over and over and over again. What's to hate? But they hated him anyway, right? Man, don't ever think. That if I'm just kind in in my beliefs or I say it in a sweet way that we are not going to be persecuted. Let me tell you what, they persecuted Jesus. Look at what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4. Let's put it up on the screen. It says, so then, 
Those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator. That's the trust God part. And continue to do good. So what do we do? If we, under, if we encounter Christian persecution, first thing we do, trust God. Everybody say, trust God. The two symbols that you and I, that we as a congregation of believers are reminded over and over that we can trust God with our lives, the two symbols that we share, the two ordinances of the church, one is baptism, right? What does it remind me? That I can trust God, I can be identified with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's it. What's our second ordinance in the church? When we gather around the table of communion, the Lord's table, right? That when we eat the bread, it is symbolic of the body of Christ that was nailed to the cross. And when we drink the juice, it is symbolic of the juice that was poured out for our forgiveness, the blood of Christ. So both of us, both of those remind us that we can commit ourselves to Christ, to God. God can deal with it. How do you think? take ourselves, just transport ourselves in our minds. We, we can't even fathom. I can't. Can you fathom if you were a believer today in your house, reading your word, God's word with your Christian brothers or Christian family in North Korea, not knowing if this would be your last time to see the family but you're bold enough to trust God to say, if the last thing they see me doing as a dad or as a mom is reading God's word, I'm willing to trust God. Imagine being in one of those Pakistani Christian churches where you never know, but they know it's coming. They're plotting every day against some church. And you never, it's hard for us to understand, folks. But I want you to know if those 215 million who suffer under extreme persecution or, 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 or high or very high persecution, one out of every 12 believers that walk the face of this earth, if they can trust God, so can we. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1, and notice I said overcome it with good. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome it with good. How do we respond? We trust God. We say, here comes the good. Here comes the good. You say, Pastor, what are the benefits? Remember, these are eight attitudes with a promise. Jesus said, blessed are those who suffer for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let me give you four quick benefits, and this is how we're going to close this series. If you and I encounter suffering, number one, we are blessed here and now. Write that down. If you and I encounter Christian suffering, we are blessed here and now. I love what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14. He says, you are, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, there's, there's the modifier, the name of Christ, that's Christian persecution, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rest on you now. Rest on you right now. You are blessed here and now. Here's number two. You ready? We deepen and refine our faith. We deepen and refine our faith. Man, as we think about what uh, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, in 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter says, man, the testing of our faith refines us and strengthens us and encourages us along the way. Notice what Peter said. He said, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which this, notice what it says, which may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Man, think about that. The testing of our faith, our persecution, our Christian persecution, is what strengthens our faith. It refines our faith. It makes us purer and purer, just like uh, the, uh, the heat purifies gold and gets, well, gets rid of all the impurities. That's what we have to understand. That's what we have to see when we go through those seasons in life. Here's number three. You ready? Write this down. When we suffer Christian persecution, we become more and more like Jesus. Man, it, it is our opportunity to identify with Christ. 
Man, if someone comes against you and presses against your faith or presses against the Word of God or presses against your walk, you can have the opportunity to say, this makes me more like Christ. What did Jesus say in John chapter 15? Let's look at it and put it on the screen. He says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Hey, folks, if you encounter a little hatred because of your faith, Jesus says, welcome to the party. All I did was fed them, I healed them, I loved them, then they nailed me to the cross for it. Then notice what Jesus said in verse 20, he says, remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. I'm not going to journey off on this because of time very much, but I want you to know that there's a whole gospel movement. There are people who preach out there that if you trust God, you will be healthy, you will be wealthy, you will wise, you will never encounter any struggle, any hurt, any heartache. Your bank account will always be full. I just want you to know that is not what Scripture teaches us. As a matter of fact, Jesus says, listen, if you do all that, you might live a tough life. Your bank account might be empty. You might encounter hardships. You might struggle with life. But when you struggle with Christian persecution, you become more and more like Jesus. Here's number four. You ready? We have eternal rewards. Remember the bookend phrase that Jesus used? The first beatitude, blessed are those who are humble in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, that's salvation. The last beatitude, blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. That someday we look at Jesus and say, look like Jesus did from that cross and said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. We look like Stephen did when he was kneeling down on the ground. He was looking up into heaven. He was being stoned for his faith. And he says, what? He says, Father, don't hold it against him. And he relieved his spirit up into the Father's hand. Polycarp, who simply said, bring on the wild beast or light the torch because I will be in the Father's presence in a nanosecond. That's when we understand, folks, there are blessings and eternal rewards and they are called the kingdom of heaven what did James the brother of Jesus say in James chapter 1 verse 12 put it up on the screen notice what he said he says blessed everybody say blessed he says blessed is the one who perseveres under trials because having stood the test that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him child of God If you or I or we as a congregation ever were to experience persecution, guess what? That just immediately precedes the crown of life. That's why, folks, we are blessed. I want to invite us just to bow our heads here. We're going to close. We're not going to close with an invitation as we close this series out. I'm going to invite our team back up. We taught you a song at at, at the beginning of this series entitled, God, I Look to You. And my prayer that as we think about these eight attitudes with promise, that we would sing the words of this song, God, I look to you and I won't be overwhelmed. God, give me the vision to see the things the way you see them, God. That's the song we sang our first week. That's the song we want to end this series with this last week. God, as a pastor, I look to you. God, as a people, we look to you. Father, thank you so much for this day. God, I I pray right now for those 215 million believers around the world who suffer under persecution that I'll never know. Men who have been torn from their families for walking in faith They're in some forced labor camp just getting a little bit of water and a little bit of food be forced to live out the rest of their days away from their family but strong in their faith. God, I pray for those people who worship in churches today fearful. that some government official or some group will come in and attack them. God, we lift them up. God, in our lives this day, 
as believers who are undoubtedly blessed. Let us sing with the saints. God, I'll look to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.